and we're, social media. Yeah. And we're at seven, so we're going to let everybody in and get started. Okay. Hit the play button here. Hello, social media. Let's do it. Welcome everyone to Veterans Breakfast Club Happy Hour for Monday, October 16th. My name is Sean Hall. I'm the Director of Programming with the VBC. Our mission is to create communities of listening around veterans and their stories to connect, educate, and inspire. Uh, we have a double header lined up uh, for tonight and for next Monday. We're going to be honoring the 40th anniversary of the Beirut bombing. Um, for those of you who uh, are usually with us, it's usually a 90-minute program tonight and next Monday. Could go up to two hours. We're getting everybody that warning to start. Um, but with me, as always, uh, is Todd DiPastino. You are, are recovering well, Todd. You're looking good. I am. <laughs> thank you, Sean. I am recovering from COVID and doing well and very happy to be back. Happy to have you back. And also joining us in the co-pilot seat tonight is Colonel Brad Washabaugh. How are you doing tonight, Brad? I'm doing great. I don't have COVID and I don't want it. So uh, <laughs> thank you. You're staying as far away from Todd as humanly possible. <laughs> been there, been there and done that. Don't need any repeats. That's right. So our goal tonight uh, is because we're going to be uh, honoring the, the anniversary of the Beirut bombing. Our goal tonight is to run over history. Uh, we're probably going to get our story up to just about the bombing. Um, we want to learn about what was going on in Beirut. We want to learn about how the U.S. got involved. Uh, we have with us also joining us uh, will be documentarian Michael Ivey. We're going to be showing a trailer in just a few minutes uh, for his uh, a trailer, We Came in Peace. And uh, thank you all for the veterans joining us. Brad is going to be introducing you all in just a few minutes. I will take over just a couple minutes here just to give up some uh, announcements. So what I'll do is to start, I'm going to share my screen. For those of you who haven't joined us before, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on and being a part of the VBC. We're always happy to say hi to new members. And uh, we're also happy to say thank you to our sponsor, which is Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Uh, they've been our sponsor for quite some time now. They are dedicated to reducing and preventing tobacco use and to getting the word out about the hazards of smoking and secondhand smoke. They're all about health, so they want people to quit. They have classes, nicotine replacement therapy, and a popular quit line, which is 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And they educate people, children especially, about tobacco use from cigarettes, cigars, pipes, chew, snuff, and other nicotine products like vaping. And finally, they advocate for public and private policies that ensure healthy places to live, work, and play. You can learn all about everything that they have on offer at their website, tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Um, thank you, Tobacco Free, for continuing to support the VBC in our mission. Uh, we also have a VBC magazine that we send out for free. We send this out quarterly. So if you don't receive this, because we don't have your address, we'd be happy to send you out this free quarterly magazine. This is the most current episode, or issue that is out right now uh, on the cover with Bob Harbula, an incredible story uh, about uh, he served in Korea and through the Chosen Reservoir. And coming up in the next issue, this is not the exact cover, but it is a mock-up. Uh, we're very excited to have Elvis join us. Um, he's still there. You didn't think, but we found him. And we got to interview him. Now, we have a great story uh, from a veteran who served with him. Um, this is going to be a wonderful magazine. And if you're very interested in it, please send us that uh, that address. You can send that to Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org, or to me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. And we'll be happy to put you on the mailing list. This is the best way that we VBC has to market who we are to everybody. And it's, it's such a great read from cover to cover. Uh, so please sign up if you haven't. We also have a couple podcasts that I've been uh, very happy to host, one being Lioness. This covers the women who were serving in Iraq prior to the combat exclusion policy. Uh, the stories that they have are uh, intense and very interesting. Um, I highly recommend this podcast, Lioness, The Origin Story. Uh, we are moving on to episode eight, and we have over 1,500 downloads uh, in a month and a half. This is how popular this podcast has become. I think VBC is the only one who's telling this story, and we're telling it from not only the Lionesses, but the FETs, the female engagement teams, and the cultural support teams. So we're getting a lot of stories uh, onto that podcast. 
And also I host The Scuttlebutt, which is VBC's other podcast. Uh, it's all about learning about military culture from a civilian perspective, which is mine because I'm not a veteran. Uh, but I had Matt Lewis on. He wrote his second book called Hiring Veterans. Uh, the first book was Mission Transition, which dealt with uh, uh, transitioning servicemen and women out of the military, giving them the tools necessary to find a job. Well, he decided to flip the coin and go to the organizations and the companies and say, hey, if you're going to hire a veteran, what's the best way to help them to succeed? I'm going to write a book for you. And it's a great book. Uh, it's a wonderful work workbook as well uh, to help companies and organizations figure out what is the best way uh, to hire a veteran and help them uh, have a long, successful career with them. A uh, great uh, conversation I had with Matt. I hope you check it out. And also uh, a previous uh, guest, an upcoming guest of the VBC, Carol Van Den Hend, she wrote and finished her trilogy. She, Or Orchid Blooming was the first, Goodbye Orchid second, and recently released Always Orchid. Uh, she will be joining us on October 30th, uh, but the third book just came out, and I believe it was maybe two or three years ago, if time flies, but we had Carol on, we talked about a previous book in the series, uh, loved it, loved having her on. Uh, we're very excited to have her join us again on Monday, October 30th, uh, to talk about finishing up the trilogy, where had, where it uh, where it's ended up, where the story has gone. Uh, and you can see here that uh, Honest and Stirring, Always Orchid inspires hope for every wounded veteran. Always Orchid earns five Purple Heart decorated stars. Uh, it's getting grave, rave reviews. Great pick here, by the way. Um, so we're excited to welcome Carol back onto the program coming up on October 30th. This book here, The Root, I'll let Brad talk about that, but Brad, I'm going to hand it off to you to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, Brad, did you want to start by mentioning uh, the book? Because I know that you're uh, a big fan of what this, uh, the history, the historical context of this book. Well, you know, if you wanted to read more about uh, Marines in Beirut, uh, this is a, you're probably your first book to go to. And there are several books out, but this is the one I've had for, for many years. And uh, it, it tells a pretty gripping and realistic story. In fact, many of the Marines and corpsmen mentioned in, in the book, some of them are with us tonight. So if you wanted to, to go back in time 40 years ago and feel uh, from their perspectives what it was like to be in Beirut, this is a good place to start. So I've, I've read the book and I recommend it if you want to learn more. And there's a lot to learn about Beirut. And, uh, you know, I am so um, proud and honored to have uh, those Beirut veterans with us tonight. And, you know, as you go around and, and uh, talk about Beirut, the one thing that I've noticed is a lot of people don't know about it or have forgotten about it. And Todd, you mentioned this uh, several weeks ago about our shows that deal with Vietnam or Korea or World War II, but the lesser known operations and campaigns like Grenada and Beirut are easily forgotten about. They're not mentioned in history books. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be a board member of the Veterans Breakfast Club is bringing these stories uh, back to life and back here so people can not only learn, but be inspired by these stories. And each and every veteran has their own story to tell. And tonight we're gonna to hear from a handful of Beirut veterans that were there before the bombing, after the bombing, during the bombing, each one has their own story to tell. And uh, it's really a story of selfless service, bravery and sacrifice. And I'm just gonna look through the audience and see uh, some of the guests that we have with us tonight. Jeff Hammond is a, is a former Navy corpsman that has an excellent resource, uh, Beirut Memorial Online, that he'll talk about. It's a great place to start to learn more about uh, Beirut in addition to reading. My friend Chuck Dallahy up there, uh, Colonel, USMC retired, a veteran of Beirut, uh, severely wounded, and uh, came back from it and had a fantastic career in the Marine Corps, and has been very helpful in connecting me with other Beirut veterans. Uh, Jeff Haskell is a gold star brother of my friend, Mike Haskell, who was killed on the 23rd of October, 1983. And uh, Mike was a special person and had a great sense of humor and, and taught me a heck of a lot. And uh, Mel DeMars is uh, a guest from our show on Urgent Fury, a uh, helicopter pilot and part of that rescue. But he had two deployments. As you know, there was four deployments to uh, Beirut by Marine amphibious units, and he was involved in the first and the fourth. 
So his unit went from Grenada right into Beirut, and that's not really a common thing in the Marine Corps. Uh, Michael Ivey is producing a documentary, and we're going to play a trailer tonight, and he's talked to a lot of Beirut veterans, and he's been touched by their stories and inspired. And let me see, as I look around, I'll go through. I'm looking through the guests. If we have any other uh, Beirut veterans, you could wave your hand. If so we I can you. see. I'm saving the general for last here. <laughs> and uh, okay, we're going to gather other veterans as they come aboard. So I'd like to introduce Major General Jim La Riviere. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at French. Got it, La Riviere. La Riviere, which means in fr in French, it means the river, right? It does. And uh, we're honored to have you tonight. He's a retired Major General in the Marine Corps. If you're counting stars, that's two. And uh, he's going to give us some background on, on Beirut. Uh, very, very complex. Uh, he has 20 years of civilian and military experience in national security affairs. Uh, his service on active duty in the reserves. He served as a combat arms officer. He commanded every level of unit in the Marine Corps from a platoon all the way up to a division a division commanding general. Uh, he deployed worldwide for exercises and operations in the Mediterranean, uh, Norway, Panama, and Afghanistan. And his time in Beirut uh, was during uh, November 1982 to February 1983 as a reconnaissance platoon commander. Uh, so as a civilian, he worked over 10 years on Capitol Hill. He was a director of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs and he was responsible for legislation and policy oversight for all aspects of the Department of Veteran Affairs. And in the private sector, he was a consultant and a policy advisor to assist companies in developing legislative and marketing strategies. And uh, he has a, uh, he is from the Citadel. There's so many general officers from the Citadel. I think I missed a boat, General. I should have, uh, instead of going to Clarion State College, should have tried to go to the Citadel. Maybe I'd have better luck. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> holds a uh, degree in uh, history and a master's in, uh, in government from Georgetown. And he's a graduate of the Air World College. Todd, not quite Yale, but he's still up there as far as academia. So, uh, General, real, real pleased to have you tonight. We're going to turn over to you to give us a little bit of background on what, what the heck were we doing in, in Beirut and what was going on at the time. You know, as I was listening to the news the past two weeks, uh, what's going on in that area it just all came back like it's boy it's such a mess to be, to be involved and before we got involved in anything in the middle east we better understand a little bit about the history and what's gone before because it really is a complex situation well, i'm not sure who who said it but history doesn't uh history doesn't it, it, you know it rhymes and so it's certainly there's a lot of echoes for what's going on today for um, um, what what went on 40 years ago. So it's an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, I appreciate all the uh, Beirut veterans that are that are out there. Um, uh, what I'm my job tonight is to do a quick overview of why we were there, and I'm going to run through a quick uh, kind of quick history of the deployment. Uh, I'm going to hit the wave tops, and so I'm going to leave out a lot of stuff. And so I know there's a lot of people out there that got a lot more in-depth knowledge about their particular deployment than I do. And so I don't mean to, to slight anybody, but we've got to cover uh, you know roughly 18 months of history here in 20 minutes. So I'm going to um, going to do the best I can. So what were we doing in Lebanon? Quick quick road to war, like we always do um, in some of these presentations. Next slide, please. My driving, who's who's driving? There we go. So Lebanon, uh, French mandate after World War One. They decide uh, the French decide they're going to create a thing called Greater Lebanon. Lebanon up until that point had basically meant the mountain of Lebanon where the Druze and the Maronites lived. The French bring in the coastal cities of Tripoli, Beirut, Sidon, Tyre, all the coastal areas, plus the Beka Valley uh, out near Syria. And they sweep up something like 18 confessional groups. 
uh, into a th this new thing called Greater Lebanon. When uh, they do a census in 1932, that's what you see up there in the other upper left-hand corner. That's the only census that's ever been taken of Lebanon in the history of the country. Uh, so when the country gets its independence in 1943, they start this thing called a confessional gov government based on that demographic uh, that you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so the, pres the Christians are more than 50% of the population and of that more than 50% at that time were Maronite. So the president of Lebanon is always gonna be a Maronite. Uh, next level down is gonna be the um, prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim. The speaker of the uh, parliament is a Shia and on and on down down the, down the line in, in what's called the, un, the national pact, which is an unwritten agreement among the confessional groups that this will always be the way it is. Unfortunately, demographics being what they were, uh, they never take another census. Uh, and by the early 1980s, it kind of looks like you see down in the lower right-hand corner, where now the Christians are much less than 50%. Uh, the Shia have grown, the Sunni have grown, the Druze are still hanging in there at about 7%. But the, the power distribution is still the same based on the 1932 census. This causes a lot of the tensions uh, that lead up to the um, what will become the, the Lebanese Civil War, which is kind of the lead up to the Marine, um, the Marine uh, occupation or um, intervention. So they get independence in 43. This actually works for a while. There's a hiccup in 58. The Marines go in in 58 because there's a there's a succession problem with the president of Lebanon at the time. They solve that problem and move on. The Marines leave. Uh, and and so it's uh, there's a whole other history there, but it's not as dramatic uh, as the as the 82 84 intervention. And actually, there's a one author calls it then the happy times, which basically is like from 1958 to 1970. This all kind of works okay. Um, it's not until 1970 that things start to uh, start to, to go south. So next slide, please. So in the 1960s, Palestine Liberation Organization is formed uh, with the purpose of overthrowing Israel and destroying it and recapturing the Palestinian lands. They, op they largely operate out of Jordan. In 1969, PLO concludes an agreement with the, with the Lebanese that governs their op the PLO's operation in Lebanon. Uh, the Lebanese government at the time is kind of split. They've got this idea that on the one hand, Lebanon for Lebanese. And on the other hand, we have to help our Arab brothers in their fight against Israel. So they allow this op the, the PLO to operate in Lebanon. It turns out to be a great thing because in 1970, Black September comes, King Hussein he says he's had it with the PLO. He kicks them out. They all move to Lebanon and occupy the southern area that you see down there in the light green uh, and begin, begin to conduct cross-border operations into Israel. Uh, during that 70 to 75 period, while the PLO is basically building a state within a state, the Lebanese government is weak and all the confessional groups start to have their own militias. So the Christian militia was basically became the Lebanese forces, also known as the Falange, the, the um, Shia group, it's called the Amal, uh, Walid Jumblat and his Druze organization is the PSP, Popular Socialist Party. Uh, and so you've got all these groups to have um, uh, begin to have their own militias. The, the, the Lebanese Civil War kicks off in 75 when Palestinians take a shot at a, uh, at a funeral ceremony uh, that's being conducted in, in Christian, uh, Christian territory. And one of the attendees was, a, was uh, Pierre Gamayel, who was the uh, founder of the Flange Party and founder of the, you know, the, his son, Bashir was running the Lebanese forces and they're off to the races. Later that same day, Flange forces have an at, um, uh, ambush a bus full of Palestinians and the war is on. Uh, war spreads over throughout the country. Uh, by 1976, it's, it's become clear that they can't get, the government can't get control and the Christian government actually invites in uh, the Syrians to come in and intervene and the Syrians, uh, Assad, um, uh, the president of, of Syria actually intervenes because he'd rather have 
a sympathetic, a Christian sympathetic government that's still engaged with Syria than possibly the PLO or one of the leftist Arab groups who would reject Syria and separate Syria from, from Lebanon. So 1976, the um, Syrians come in, uh, the civil war kind of goes into an abeyance, and you end up with the with the map you see there on the right. So the dark green is the area occupied by Syria. The, the pink or whatever color that is, is the is flange, Christian Maronite area, and the everything south. Bottom line here is the Lebanese government doesn't control anything that except the presidential palace and the Ministry of Defense up in Babda. That's 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 all they control. Uh 78. Bashir Gamayel, the son of the founder of the Falange, consolidates all the Christian groups into one single um, uh, operation called the Lebanese Forces. That same year, the, Leban the uh, Israelis conduct a limited objective operation called uh, Operation uh, Latani that pushes the PLO back across the border a little bit to get quit, have the missiles stop landing in uh, northern, northern Lebanon. In 1981, there's a what they call the missile crisis, uh, and this is really where we start to get into the our involvement. Uh, Lebanese forces attack a Palestinian refugee camp. Uh, they've got an agreement with the uh, Israelis. The Lebanese Christians have an agreement with the Israelis that if they need it, they've got they can get air support. Um, Syria brings in some missiles into the Bekaa Valley, anti-air missiles into the Bekaa Valley. This causes the Reagan administration to send Phil Habib to the region as a uh, envoy to try to negotiate an agreement between the PLO and the Israelis to stop and, and, and kind of stop some of the um, cross-border operations that are going on. So next slide, please. So 81, Phil Habib does manage to get this PLO-Israeli ceasefire. There's a disagreement on what this actually means. The Israelis think it means it's a worldwide ceasefire between the Israelis and the PLO. The PLO says, it's, no, it's just along the southern border between Lebanon and Israel. Uh, at the same time that that's going on, there's there's movement afoot inside the, inside the Israeli cabinet uh, led by Minister of Defense Ariel Sharon, who's a hardliner, that um, he, he is building up an effort, uh, putting together war plans that come hell or high water, at some point when there's a provocation that they're going to invade Lebanon and just do away with the PLO, um, which sounds hauntingly familiar from the what they're planning on doing with Hamas uh, today. Um, that pro they, they, they telegraph that to the United States. There's a whole discussion about whether Al Haig, the Secretary of State at the time, greenlit the operation or he just ignored and said, you know, you better not do it unless there's a real provocation, which the Israelis took as a green light. Bottom line is early June 1982, um, uh, a PLO, uh, or not the PLO, Palestinian takes a shot at the uh, uh, Israeli ambassador in London. It turns out it's not the PLO that does the attack. It's a, George Shabash's radical PLFP. Uh, that does it, who'd also try to assassinate Yasser Arafat at one point. So these guys weren't even on board, uh, all on board in the same uh, same boat. But it didn't matter. It was Palestinians. The dead at 6th June 1982, the Israelis crossed the border. It's Operation Peace for Galilee, three axis, one up the coast road, one down the middle, and uh, one on the right-hand side overlooking the Bekaa Valley. Uh, and they are off to the races. Uh, the, the original... Uh, operation was sold as a limited objective operation, kind of like the 78 operation, just to push him back. In a week, they are outside of Beirut. Uh, in on the day, uh, I think it was day two or day three of this, um, they, uh, the Israelis engaged the Syrian Air Force and shoot down, um, I just got to look, 23 Syrian aircraft and uh, disable most of the air anti air. Missiles in the in the uh, in the Bekaa Valley, uh, so the Assyrians are kind of neutered on this, and the Israelis are up against um, have got basically the PLO pushed back into Beirut. Uh, get a little bit ahead of the story here. Uh, Hague is replaced by uh, George Shultz, the Secretary of State, in the middle of July. Um, 
the you know, why don't we just go ahead and let's go to the next slide and we can. So this is what we end up with uh, by the end of the first week of uh, so the middle of June, uh, you've got uh, the PLO basically surrounded in West Bay route. So uh, during the during the Civil War, you can see that red line down the right hand side there is called the green line. That's the dividing line between East and West Bay route. And it's the dividing line between the Christian side, the east side, and the Muslim side, the west side. So the PLO is now in that red area on the left, uh, completely surrounded, and everybody's got a problem. Uh, you got water on two sides. PLO can't go anywhere. The phalanger on the east, the Israelis are on the south, and they got water on two sides, nowhere to go. The Israeli, Israelis got a problem. They thought they had to deal with the Christian phalange that if they got this far, the phalange would go in and clean out the PLO in downtown West Beirut. The, the phalange at this point are led by Bashir Gemayel, who's, again, the son of the founder of the, the phalange party. He thinks he's going to be president of Lebanon, and the last thing he needs is a bunch, he's got to have Arab votes to get him elected. He's not going to get those votes if he's going to go into West Beirut and kill every, start killing people. So he decides they're not going to go. So everybody's a little bit stuck here. Enter Phil Habib uh, and the um, the mandate from the Secretary of State from the Reagan administration, negotiate a way out of this stalemate. Uh, and so for the 70, over the course of a 70 day siege of downtown Beirut, where every day it's the Israelis are pounding the living daylights out of the PLO who are in tunnels underneath West Beirut. Phil Habib is trying to negotiate a, 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 a departure. Uh, let's next slide, please. So the policy goals for the the were set very early on for the by the Reagan administration. This these are basically what Al Haig told. Habib, when he was sent in to go try to negotiate um, uh, a solution to this problem, we want all the all the US, all the forces out of Lebanon. It's PLO, Syrian, Israeli. We want Lebanese authority over the entire country, and we want territorial assurance for Israel that there's not going to be any more attacks. These policy goals don't change throughout the entire operation. It's the, it's one of the few times, and I you can look at some a U.S. intervention like this and say. Hey, what were we trying to do? This is what we were trying to do. Uh, and step one for Habib was get the PLO out. There's a lot of different discussions on how they came around to the idea of putting in a multinational force. Some, some people would say it was actually Yasser Arafat's idea that he said he would leave if there was an international force that would cover him so that the Israelis didn't slaughter them on the way out. But regardless of you know how how we you know the negotiations and how they developed the bottom line was at, at the end by the mid, by the middle of July into late July they've kind of coalesced around this idea that they're going to have to be a multinational force that's going to have to be on the ground now the Israelis are you know fighting this there's a lot of back there's a lot of backsliding on behalf of Yaraf, Arafat if, when when Habib would go in and tell the Israelis, hey, we need to back off so we can negotiate. If they backed off, the PLO would start to say, hey, we're not leaving. The Israelis would turn the, turn the heat up again. PLO would say, okay, we'll leave. And we'd go a couple of rounds of this. And so it's not until uh, really um, late August into early September that, you, uh, that we, we finally get an agreement um, for the uh, for the multinational force to go in, it's going to be three three countries: the United States, France, and Israel. And the unit that gets finally gets negotiated, completely arbitrary number. Habib says the U.S. contingent is going to be 800 people, and they select the 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 Mao, what was then called the Mao, the Mao float, as the as the uh, unit that's going to provide the forces. Um, uh, to provide the cover for the withdrawal of uh, the PLO. So next slide, please. So what, what became multinational force one? Uh, there's my old boss there, um, Rick Zinzer, uh, leading his company off the, um, off the LST into the Beirut uh, port in order to conduct um, multinational force uh, one, which was the evacuation. 
They land on 25 August 1982, which was the same day that my uh, my Mal left uh, Moorhead City, uh, knowing absolutely nothing about this. But uh, that's the mission. The multinational force will assist Lebanon. Was supposed to assist the Lebanese forces from carrying out to carry out the actual departure. <clears throat> There's a whole long story here. There's folks with the, with that mouth that can tell you a lot of stories about the different back and forth and how the PLO departed and the drama surrounding Yasser Arafat's actual departure. But 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 in the end, this actually worked. The PLO got on ships. They left and went to like six different countries, and it. Um, it was really very compact from the standpoint that as the PLO left, Secretary Weinberger and the Secretary of Defense said, okay, we're done here. 10 September, uh, 10 September, the Marines packed up and went back on the ship. Then the multinational force left. The PLO is gone over to diplomacy now to figure out how to get the Israelis out, how to get the Syrians out, and how to get the Lebanese to take commit, take take control of their country. At that point in history, for that very brief, for a very brief period, it was going to be a diplomatic mi mission only, and the Marines, you know, there was there was not going to be there was no intent to have another multinational force go in. Next slide, please. How am I doing on time? How much time I got left? You're doing great. Okay. So why the Marines go back in? Uh, Marines left on the tenth. 14 September, only four days later, uh, uh, Bashir Gemayel, who, who during the middle of multinational force one is actually elected president of Lebanon. Uh, they actually managed to corral enough parliamentarians uh, at an army barracks up in the mountains, get them all in a room and they actually elect them as president. Um, he is president elect. He goes to the Falange headquarters in downtown um, uh, Beirut in the, Ash the very Tony Ashrafi district uh, to give a speech. You, you, you have a meeting there pretty much every week on the same day. Uh, a Syrian operative plants a bomb in the building and levels it. Uh, you know, that's the, the, the rubble pile you see there on the left is them searching through the rubble looking for him. And they assassinate uh, the president-elect. Um, this sets off a series of, uh, a series of chain reactions the Israelis uh, freak out, quite frankly, because they don't know what's going to happen. They had been held short uh, in the agreement with uh, with Habib and the evacuation kind of at the airport uh, south of the city uh, and had not gone into West Beirut. They immediately, the Israelis immediately occupy West Beirut in the aftermath of the assassination and sort of stabilize the area. The next thing that happens is they're controlling most of the access to, to Beirut at this point. They allow uh, flange groups in East Beirut to pass through their lines and go into a place called the Sovereign Shatila Palestinian Refugee Camps. Uh, that it was on the previous map. But anyway, for those of you, all Beirut bets, you know that you know the area. It's immediately north of the airport uh, is where the two refugee camps were go in there and, you know, by all accounts, you know, depending on who you talk to, it's 500 to 800 innocent civilians, women, children. And these are the families that were left behind by the evacuated PLO fighters. Obviously, this sets off a firestorm uh, around the world and uh, is, is done at great consternation, causes great consternation uh, at the highest levels of the U.S. government. Um, taking a step back, uh, from the very start of the conversation on going into Lebanon, there were two sides. There was the, the DOD joint staff side that didn't want to do the operation. There was State Department National Security Council staff that was that was um, uh, was in favor of doing this. Uh, the, the Obviously, the president overrode the DOD advice for multinational force one that same and, and sent the Marines in and it worked out. Now they're, the same debate is kicked off again um, about whether or not the multinational force should go in. There's a huge amount of guilt. Uh, Phil Habib makes the point to everybody who will listen that this would not have happened if the Marines had stayed, uh, that the Israelis would never have let the phalange in, that there would not have been the massacre, wouldn't be in this situation. 
And so really out of guilt and of, uh, you know, this idea that we should have stayed or if we'd stayed, we could have prevented this. The Marines were sent back in uh, along with the rest of the multinational force uh, to um, in, in the Beirut. It's not really more. Com- Unfortunately, it's not really much more complicated than that. The mission is it now becomes the question, what are they going to do? What is the actual mission? Next slide, please. And this is where everybody starts to struggle. The joint staff really isn't sure what we're supposed to do. So this is actually the mission statement from the JCS alert order, which ends up being referenced as the actual mission statement for the execute order. And it's basically what you see here. It says, we're going to establish an environment um, so the Lebanese forces can carry out their responsibilities in the Beirut area and provide that multinational force presence. And this is where you get the first uh, inkling that the, the mission is, in fact, presence, whatever that turns out to be. And as for those of you who know, the Long Commission, you know, went on and on about that. It's about how that was interpreted and what the presence mission actually meant. This will make its way all the way through. Uh, in my longer slide deck, I, I walk it all the way through the chain of command. It goes out to Sink, you know, to, to um, um, sink a snap your issues at the Sixth Fleet. Anyway, next slide. This ends up being the Marine mission. Provide a presence in Beirut to help, uh, in turn, help establish stability necessary for the Lebanese government to regain control of the capital. That's out of the 32nd mile. After action report, they said that's what their mission was. There's no evidence that that ever changed throughout the entire mission from the from the day they went back in in September 1982 to the day the Marines left in uh, February 1984. Uh, next slide. So this is how they ended up negotiating the. Uh, there, there was a lot going on here. Again, a lot of behind the scenes negotiations. But this is this is the zones everybody remembers. We got the airport. Uh, the Italians got the middle section there, the slums, the sovereign Shatila camp, and the French got downtown. Uh, notice that it's all West Beirut. So this is all the Arab portion of town. And immediately after the multinational force went in, the Lebanese army went into West Beirut for the first time since before the Civil War to kind of, again, we were there to help them gain control of their city. And we started with West Beirut. Um, and I guess the other, the other thing I make on this slide, it's, it's hard to see on the right-hand side along that green line is the, um, is the, the old Sidon road, the, the, the multinational force and in particular, the U S zones, uh, the lines were drawn with the Sidon road exclusive. So that meant that the Sidon road was outside of our area of control. So the Israelis theoretically could run up and down that road, intersect the Beirut Damascus highway and run their supply routes out to their forces out along the, the Beirut Damascus highway. This, this becomes a source of tension late, uh, as we go into the deployment, as we get a lot of uh, friction that will ultimately result in uh, Chuck Johnson's um, uh, interaction with the um, Israeli tanks on 4 February uh, 1983. Next slide, please. So what they call the lost months, and that's, this is where I, when I was there, they call it the lost months because actually after, after the Marines landed in September, after, you know, BLT-38 shows up to relieve uh, relieve them in uh, November of 1982, which was my, my rotation, through to February, things were kind of quiet. Uh, it, it actually was okay. And the, there's a theory that the, the Israelis were basically having trouble because the, the occupation of Lebanon was not, not happy at home, it was not going down well at home. Um, and the sovereign Shatila massacres were beginning to you know, bubble their way through, and it was becoming obvious that that the Israeli government was aware of what happened at the highest levels. The Syrians are on their butt because they got they're they they've got no stomach for a fight, and for once the the Lebanese are not fighting, and they're kind of like okay with it. So, four things going on here in this slide. The left hand slide. That's my platoon. Our job was from day one. We got we got tasked to patrol East uh, East Beirut because the Lebanese government asked us to. Uh, so that the Lebanese army could occupy East Beirut and throw and, and 
in the same way that they were occupying West Beirut and show that they could they could control the Christian militias and the, and the Muslim militias. I started patrolling on 4 November. We left 15 February. The Lebanese army didn't move in that entire time. They, they finally moved into East Beirut the day after I left. I don't take it personally. But that's what was going That was one of the things that was going on. The second slide down there in the lower left, training. The multinational force, our battalion got, got assigned to do training with the um, Lebanese army. And in November, we opened up an office for military uh, security cooperation led by a uh, army colonel named Tom Fintel uh, th to start bringing in trainers, start bringing in equipment, start bringing in ammunition and all that to help establish a Lebanese army that could then go out and take control of Lebanese territory. Lower right hand corner, negotiations. This is where it really fell through. This was the time when, again, the Israelis were the Syrians and everybody was kind of exhausted and they should have been able to, the, the, the theory was, and there are actually timelines. I've seen the, the, the proposed timelines. They had a time, a diplomat, diplomatic timeline to get uh, the rest of the PLO out that were up North, the Syrians out, the Israelis out and be done by literally be done by Christmas, 1982. Uh, and they could not get the negotiations to go there. So what you see there is Weinberger, Reagan, Schultz, and Habib uh, sitting at a table trying to hash this out, and it, they can't get it done. And then in the upper right-hand upper right -hand corner there, that's the Druze militia. The war stopped in Beirut. But for those of you who probably remember, um, for all the deployments, you could look up in the Shoes Mountains in any single night and see the firefights. And they didn't stop. And it was the, it was the, mostly the Druze and the Maronites going at it, uh, trying to trying to have it out um, up in the mountain, readjusting their lines, capturing and recapturing villages. Uh, so while Beirut was was stable, it really the war was was still the civil war was still kind of on uh, up in the mountains. Next slide, please. So the situation deteriorates. Obviously, that's the that's the embassy, uh, U.S. embassy after the bombing. Next slide. So again, quiet through March, and then this most you know, for those of you who were there, um, you know, came in after I let my my unit rotated out in February. You'll be more familiar with this because you were on the ground living it. Uh, Italian patrol attacked in March. Next day, Marine patrol. That was the first the first. Uh, real indication uh, that maybe things were going south. 18 April, the big event, uh, the, embassy, the embassy bombing kills 17 uh, US citizens, wipes out the entire CIA uh, station, uh, uh, obviously with the adverse effect on Intel. Uh, but Colonel Meade, the MU commander, or the MAO commander, in spite of the terror threat, we continue to keep that proper balance between security and presence. and. It's interesting he makes that comment because that becomes the crux of the problem throughout the rest of the deployment. What does presence mean? A lot of the commanders said presence means we've got to um, we, we've got to be visible and we've got to be showing that we're out there trying to keep uh, to support the Lebanese army in their mission of of um, uh, taking over more control of their country. At the same time, we got to maintain a proper security balance. Uh, and, you know, that that becomes, you know, one of the findings at the end of the uh, in the long commission after the bombing. Next. Next slide. So uh, a lot going on here. But again, uh, the. The focus for the diplomacy was to get the Israelis out. The Israelis were threat dragging their feet because they wanted a peace agreement with the Lebanese. The Lebanese didn't want a peace agreement because they thought that would leave them ostracized in the rest of the Arab world. Anyway. Negotiations finally get a peace agreement, uh, an, it's a, an agreement, not a peace agreement, but an agreement ending the war, 17 May, with the implication that the Israelis at some point will withdraw. This now becomes, you know, a rush because they know the Israelis are going to leave. Who's going to take over the area between, you know, south of the airport all the way back down to the border? Who's going to occupy that area? Well, in theory, it was going to be the Lebanese army, which is nowhere near ready to go do that. Uh, and so at this point is when you start to see all the Lebanese 
um, militias now start to jockey for position. Uh, even as the Lebanese government and the Lebanese army uh, are, are attempting to get themselves spun up so they can kind of so hopefully take control of some of these some of this territory. Um, but you can see 30 June there, the Lebanese forces enter the Shif Mountains for the first time. Uh, by July, they're having the Flange and the Druze are having it out in East Beirut in the Shif Mountains. Uh, the first shells land on the airport, 20th, 22nd July, 83. At this point, uh, it's clear, you know, we're not providing the security, you know, we're not providing the um, stability that, um, that that was intended. 22 July is also a big date because that day, that's the day Bud McFarlane, former Marine, um, Deputy National Security Advisor, is named to replace Habib. Uh, as the Mideast envoy, while at the same time retaining his job as Deputy National Security Advisor. And he actually comes to Beirut and takes up residence in the uh, in the ambassador's residence up in Babda, overlooking Beirut, uh, which is part of the end story here. Next slide. August, situation continues to deteriorate. Uh, laugh, Drews fights, uh, artillery, uh, you know, rockets in the defense ministry in the presidential palace, uh, airports being attacked, Marines, you know, are being shelled. There's fire, there's firefights. Finally, the U.S., the, you know, Marines return, finally are allowed to return fire with artillery uh, on the 29th of August. On the, the big event, next big event, though, is on 4, 4 September, the Israelis decide they're going to leave. Uh, and this now kicks off what becomes known as the September Mountain War. The, the, the gloves are off. The militia groups are at it. Um, immediately before this, Wally Jimblot and the um, leader of the Druze uh, creates uh, uh, allies with some other leftist Arab groups and call them, creates the Lebanese National Movement, which essentially becomes the leftist uh, Arab groups that combine support the PLO, Syrian-backed, that's, that are in direct opposition with the Falange and by extension, the Lebanese army. Next slide. So Jumblatt's crew of leftists, leftists are fighting you know, uh, with the Maronites uh, up on the mountainside there. Uh, the Lebanese army, you know, Gamayel decides to send Colonel Ayoun, future chief of staff of the army, future president of Lebanon. But at this point, brigade commander up to a place called Suko Gar, which you can see down there in the bottom right hand corner uh, to stop the, uh, the the attacks. All these attacks are taking place right down the ridge line from the ambassador's residence. He can, you know, the ambassador uh, McFarland can see what's going on. Uh, they are right down, right down the line, and they're freaking out. Um, Colonel Garrity at this point is still maintaining that the U.S. is the, the multinational force. The Marines are neutral; they are not a party to this fight. Uh, but it. Uh, but at this point, it, McFarlane and his crew of National Security Council staffers that are there are convinced that the United States needs to do more in support, direct support of the Lebanese uh, government, the Lebanese army. So next slide. So the firefights continue on 11 September. McFarlane sends a flash message to the NSC. Uh, they call it the sky is falling memo. That says basically uh, serious threat that there's going to be a military defeat of the Lebanese forces at Sukkot Garb unless something's done, and that can mean the fall of the Lebanese government. He also makes a dramatic line in there that when he sends it, that you know he could be behind enemy lines within the next 24 hours. So they are at the same time they send this message directly back to the White House. Uh, they are also bothered. He and General Steiner, the JCS advisor, are going direct to the Mao commander bypassing the entire chain of command saying, you got to fire and support a naval gunfire and support of the laugh. General, or Colonel Garrity denies it. Uh, and But that sky is falling memo gets the White House to issue a national security directive addendum that basically sets the conditions that, allow, that will allow uh, the US to fire and direct support. Next slide. And I'm skipping over all sorts of stuff here, but anyway, the fighting intensifies. By 19 September, the conditions that were outlined in the National Security Directive, and the conditions were 
the Lebanese army had to be under attack from non-Lebanese forces, the Syrians. They had to be um, uh, not, not attacked by, had to be attacked by Syrian forces uh, and had to be, the government had to request it. And the commander had to make an assessment that um, the Lebanese forces were in, were in trouble. Uh, that those, those conditions were met on 19 September and the United States fires the first naval gunfire in direct support of the, of the um, Lebanese army. Many, many people have written about this. So this is the turning point where the United States goes from being a neutral, neutral party to becoming just another militia inside an internal Lebanese firefight. After all that happens on the 26th of September, there's a ceasefire um, that is negotiated uh, and they set an agreement to have talks in Geneva uh, to try to solve the internal Lebanese situation. Next slide. But behind the scenes, it turns out it's too late. Uh, completely separate from all of that, uh, Imad Mugania uh, in the what was then I guess called the Islamic Jihad, the predecessor to Hezbollah, uh, backed by Iran, enabled by Syria, puts together the car, the truck bomb uh, that finally, uh, in the end, hits the building on on 23 October 1983. And as we all know, the you know, largest non-nuclear explosion on record, single single largest loss day of loss of life for the Marine Corps since Iwo Jima, uh, and fundamentally changes the course of the the intervention. Next slide. Even after the bombing, and it's it's amazing because I've been through the Reagan Library and looking at all the National Security Council documents. They the the administration still thought they could salvage this. Uh, the Mao digs in in November. Uh, by 4 December, you know, Marines are still taking shells from Syrian territory, taking KIA, WIA, they're responding with naval gunfire and airstrikes. New Jersey ends up showing, New Jersey's been deployed. They're firing by, start firing by 15 December. Um, and so the, on, this, this goes on through the rest of December into January. Next slide. But it's, it's just not enough. Uh, the internal Lebanese, dynamics uh, just won't work. Uh, even as Reagan says on the 4th of February, uh, we're going to, uh, we're, we're there, we can, we're going to stay. Uh, at the very same day, Prime Minister Rezaan resigns, that collapses the Lebanese government, the Laf Brigade in Bakad defects. The, uh, I think it's the 4th Brigade, it was the Shia Brigade actually defects from the army. They end up being the ones that take over the airport from the um, from the Marines when they leave. Anyway, by the 7th, Marines, Reagan orders the Marines back to the ships. By the 26th of February, it's over. Uh, and the Marines withdrawal is complete with the exception of a small detachment that's still guarding the embassy um, uh, in downtown, downtown Beirut. So two, two after action reports, uh, all, both of them focused largely on the bombing and the security, the long commission report that was commissioned immediately after the um, the bombing. Uh, I'm sure most of you have read through it or know of it. Uh, it you know, it's highly critical of the presence mission and highly critical of the security arrangements in and around the, the, uh, the building. Uh, the House Armed Services Committee conducted an investigation very similarly uh, focused on the security arrangements. Uh, again, highly critical. Although the minority report for that the uh, investigation did briefly touch uh, on the idea that the political military situation the Marines were placed in was highly problematic and, and, and contributed uh, to the to the uh, to the failure of the mission. But it's it's very cursory and nowhere an in depth study of the Paul Mill problems that were going on at the time. So anyway, I've probably gone on longer than I should, but that's kind of how we ended up in the kind of quick quick run through the history. But again, I, there's many of you out there who lived a lot of the detail of this. Yeah, and that's my final shot. This I I do this I do this I've done this presentation eight times at the Joint Forces Staff College. This is always my final slide. Um, I wasn't there for the bombing. 
Uh, this photo was taken the day I got on the helicopter to go back to the ship, 14 February uh, 1982. And for whatever reason, I walked out through that gate, turned around, took a picture of the building. And, and it's always kind of emotional because it's it's probably the view that the bomber had minutes before he drove through that center center entrance and you know pancaked the building. Um, so I always end with this uh, slide and the comment that... Uh, as we've learned over and over again, it's it, before you send Marines or any U.S. military personnel into a uh, deployment, you need to have a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish and a clear strategy on how to how to accomplish it. All right. Thanks. Back over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, as you said, you probably as much as was left off uh, uh, of the information, that so much is still in there to make it a confusing, absolutely confusing mess that we were involved in. And, uh, you know, Brad, I want to shift over to you just to see what your thoughts are and just like the, that, that history lesson. Well, you know, I think a lot of people go back to, uh, rightfully so, September 11th as a mark in the sand for our war on terrorism. But I think uh, October 23rd, 1983, is really the start of a mark where terrorism in fighting an asymmetrical warfare, such as car bombs, truck bombs, terrorist acts, have been uh, targeted uh, against the U.S. policy. And in Beirut, uh, they were successful. And, you know, one criticism is that we never really retaliated. We never really made them pay for what they did. Now, that's a broad statement to make, but you heard, you'll you hear it over and over again uh, when we look back at Beirut. And our enemies learned a lesson from it. So a very complex situation, as we heard. <clears throat> a lot of players, we got involved in the middle of a civil war with an illy defined mission and confusing rules of engagement. A lot to be learned, but even more so, there's a lot not to be forgotten. And that's where the danger comes in, is forgetting uh, the lessons of Beirut. And that's really, I think tonight when we start hearing from the veterans and their perspective, I think we'll bring that 40 years ago forward to today to to what uh, they feel and what they experienced and what we can learn from it. Greg Yost had several questions here in the chat. Greg, I, I unmuted you. Um, and Great. maybe our, our panel here of uh, veterans might be able to, to answer your questions. So I figured you could ask them. Absolutely terrific presentation. Thank you so much. As people on this program know me well, I tend to try to get the big picture questions here. What were why the soldiers who were there? Why were they there? What were they doing? Not only what were they doing when they were there, but sort of what was the big picture? And I guess along that line, I guess my question, one of my big questions is, did the did the administration keep Congress up to speed on this? I mean, with War Powers Act. Or were they sort of just doing this all on their own? This started out as a certain mission under UN auspices. Then it, there was a mission creep, obviously, and, and went from sort of peacekeeping to active engagement. Was the U.S. keeping Congress, I'm sorry, was the administration keeping Congress involved or was this sort of uh, underhanded in some sort of way? I've unmuted our, our panel here of veterans, so feel free to, uh, whoever would like to chime in. Jim, I saw you shaking yeah, I'll, your head. I'll, I'll, sir, I'll, I'll take that. The, the answer is yes. It, they're, they're, they kept Congress um, uh, up to speed. So it's kind of two parts to the question. The, the first debate was whether or not, uh, and this, uh, this was one of the very early examples of uh, an intervention right af after the, I think it was 1975 War Powers Act. Right. So it's a very early example of this. And the administration agonized over what the requirement was, and they kept, uh, I can't remember the sections, but there's a section that you do, you, you, you sending them in if it's combat operations, and then there's another one, it's notification if it's if it's not combat. They did the non-combat one saying that this was not a combat mission. This was a, um, uh, I guess, peacekeeping mission or presence mission or whatever. Uh, but they were always looking over their shoulder that Congress was, you know, was going to invoke war powers and, and, and restrict this. Congress finally does restrict it. Um, and they actually pass, um, they, they, they pass legislation. I think it's in early October, 1983, extending the mission for 18 months. Um, 
And so there's there was a huge debate. There was a lot of administration pressure that said we got to stay the course and all this other stuff. And it just oddly it gets passed literally weeks before <laughs> before the bombing. Uh, and then of course immediately after that, you know the the winds change and everybody's like, oh my God, what were we doing? You know, we got to get them out. It's sort of another part to the question. And uh, later on, we know that there were American civilians taken hostage in Lebanon. This ends up to be the whole arms for hostages deal, right? Had any of these people been taken hostage by this point or was that after sort of this whole thing? And then there was also the USA-6 pilot shot down. Yep. Who, sh who shot him down? Who held him? And did the US make any deals for his release or did the other side just release it saying, uh, this guy's too hot to handle? First, first question. I I want to say was a professor. There was there was one guy from the American University of Beirut. The guy Malcolm was, Kerr. Malcolm yeah, Kerr. Kerr. Yeah, I think he was the president, right? Yeah, he's um he's the coach of the basketball coach's father. Yeah. So he. he uh, but that's I think that's the only one like during this period. It real the, the hostage period doesn't. Well, Really pick up until eighty four in eighty four. Bill, Bill Buckley with Bill Buckley. Yeah, with Bill, Bill Buckley, Buckley right. in, in in which was right after that February, March, April eighty four. Michael, is that that right? Right in the right in there. Right in there. So there 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 that so that that doesn't happen. What was your? I'm sorry, I got lost. Uh, the, 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 there was during the military action, a U.S. pilot was shot yes. down. Yeah. Yeah. And um and was released. Now I got US I glossed released. over I glossed over that part. In, that enough. was in the December time frame. That was the airstrike. December fourth. I, I, yeah. I got that one for you. That was December fourth. Yeah. There were there was a big sortie that took out on December fourth. Vietnam era style sortie. Thirty six, thirty seven planes. But earlier that month, they already knew that the Syrians had these SAM missiles. So. Two of these planes get shot down and it goes off at the wrong time of day. Um, and two of the pilots are recovered. Um, well, I'm sorry, one pilot is killed. His name's Mark Lang. His weapons guy behind him, it was an A6 intruder, I think. Yeah. Um, he gets it's captured. Not, his weapon, it, his, it, no, it's not behind him. It's a, it's yeah, two feet one. side by side. The pilots. I'm the sorry. I'm Mark sorry. Lang. <laughs> The, and uh, the, Bobby Goodman was a B, B, battalion or the BN on the right side. Yeah. Uh, the first guy that got shot down was an A7. He was the air group commander. Uh, we fished him out and uh, took him over back to the carrier. A lot in between, but that's enough of that. Uh, Goodman and Mark Lang get shot down. They're on this big alpha strike. They were making uh, uh, F-14 tarps runs, recon runs over the Beka Valley for you know weeks ahead of time and they started getting shot at by uh, whoever down there uh, had the anti-aircraft uh, guns. And so these guys get, there's a big alpha strike like, uh, like mentioned, uh, all kinds of stuff about how late it was uh, ordered, not enough time to be ready, uh, lots of planes uh, over there and, and uh, 1A6 gets shot down. Lang dies on impact basically and Bobby Goodman is captured. And he's held by the Syrians and, you know, a week or two weeks or a month or whatever is later, the guy that got him out of there was Jesse Jackson. Right, right, right. I don't yeah. know how that happened, but I know that that's what happened. Jesse Jackson got him released. Uh, so that's, yeah, it was an A6. Yeah, it, it was. It was there was an old joke about, there was an old joke about that when they looked into a cell and says, uh, hey, uh, there's a Jackson guy here to get you. And he said, Reggie or uh, Michael. <laughs> I can believe it. They got him out. Sean, I, I think uh, Michael Ivey, here, producer uh, of a documentary, we're about to see some footage from the trailer from uh, We Came in Peace, a very moving six minute piece. I wonder if we could show that now and kind of lead into some more discussion with our veterans. Of course. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up. Uh... And everybody can see this. And we'll go ahead and hit play. Uh, as Brad mentioned, it's about a six minute trailer, um, but uh, powerful nonetheless. <clears throat> it was a tragic, very tragic time. You know, the lives lost at the embassy, the lives lost at, at the, the, the barracks compound. It's almost like we, we don't want to remember it. 
It's like a black eye. But uh, for those that were involved in it, they'll never forget it. And their families that were involved in it, they'll never forget it. But I think a lot of people, it's not they never forgot it, they just never hear about it. A step-grandson uh, named Stephen, and he knows I'm, I'm a Marine. You cut me open, I bleed Marine Corps green. And he gave me a book. It's about 400 pages of Marine Corps history, and it goes into detail from their dress to uh, Tun Tavern to uh, Archibald Henderson to Korea, Vietnam, all of it. There's two paragraphs on Beirut. It's just very disappointing to know that it's been kind of swept into the dustbin of history and forgotten. I mean, when I went back to college, they go, they talk about World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, and then from Vietnam, it jumps right into Gulf War I. And every, there was a lot of stuff in between. We lived it, and we forgot about it. The government of Lebanon has requested, and I have approved, the deployment of United States forces to Beirut as part of a multinational force. In the days ahead, they and forces from France and Italy will be playing an important but carefully limited non-combatant role. The parties to the plan have agreed to this role and have provided assurances on the safety of our forces. You're going to run into situations. See, that's the thing before you go in that you think about on a, on a peacekeeping mission is, uh, you know, what's my purpose here? You know, I can remember, you know, standing at the airport and seeing these rockets flying all over the place. And how the hell we get in the middle of all this? I was the fourth Marine unit going into Beirut doing rigorous patrolling both foot and mobile, at the same time working with the people, helping them get on their feet. That's what the Lebanese mission was really all about in a, in a strategic sense. You're taking care of people. You're trying to make sure that the uh, bad people don't get an opportunity to take over and hurt the good people. When we have our rules of engagement, our procedures, our conduct in combat, peacekeeping, the restraint, and all those things that have it, that sounds very good, and it works, you know. But the other side, they have their vote. They see what we're doing. They know what our vulnerabilities are. I expect it to be hit. You could smell it in the air. It'd uh, start going downhill in a hurry. And we got hit with uh, unimaginable uh, ferocity, a horrific terrorist act. With dawn just breaking, a truck, looking like a lot of other vehicles in the city, approached the airport on a busy main road. At the wheel was a young man on a suicide mission. The truck smashed through the doors of the headquarters building in which our Marines were sleeping and instantly exploded. The four-story concrete building collapsed in a pile of rubble. At almost the same instant, another vehicle on a suicide and murder mission crashed into the headquarters of the French peacekeeping force. 241 Americans and 58 French peacekeepers died. And just thinking about it still makes tears well up in my eyes. And just how many men, good, solid, stable men, not any one of which I would have been proud as to be my brother or my son. But they, they, were, uh, they were killed. It was a strategic weapon, and it accomplished a strategic mission. Their objective 
is to not only remove America, but all Western influence, the peacekeeping force, withdraw from Lebanon and, uh, and a change in the United States foreign policy. And they did it. And they did it. I still think it was a big mistake not to have some retribution. You have to answer that, and I think we've paid a price for that because it whet the appetites of the terrorists and so on. I hate terrorists. And uh, I guess I have a reason to. Thank you for sharing that with us, Mike. I figured uh, let you speak a bit about your documentary. Uh, all I can say is it's you know it's a great honor to um, tell the Marine story, uh, and, and it's not just the Marine story; it's every American that served. We can't forget. A lot of people say, "Well, that's the Marine bombing," but th there were um, you know sailors, there were corpsmen, there were soldiers. We lost diplomats, you know, our, our foreign service because there were three bombings. There were three what I call Pearl Harbor type events that um, that aren't thought of like Pearl Harbor, unfortunately. They, they're not thought of like the Alamo. There is no um, remember Lebanon, which I don't really understand that. Um, so I'm going to try to get to the bottom of it by talking to as many people as possible, stitching their stories together. Maybe it's not too late to remember uh, Beirut, to remember Lebanon, because um, as as you know, first, let me thank um, Jim and there's um, John Delagustin is on here. Jeff Hammond's on here. I, I came in just knowing um, about a guy in West Virginia who was friend of a bunch of my friends. So and I'm a filmmaker. Um, I didn't realize at the time, you know, it was going to be such a sort of many layers to this story. It's a multinational, multi-year um, mission set in the most religiously and politically complex region of the world with three built-in Pearl Harbors. So it, it, it's hard to get to the bottom of it. So thank these gentlemen so much for helping me and everyone, you know, because I am doing a bunch of interviews. I'm talking to a bunch of people. I'm learning everything I can. Now, what do you do with all that? You got to distill it down into whatever this container is going to be. Maybe it'll be an episodic if a network is interested, but more likely it's two hours. So within that two hours, I really have to just check three boxes. I'm hoping to get everyone that served and sacrificed recognized. I think as soon as you get recognized and you get the bigger story, you're going to be respected. And then I think you'll be remembered, you know, because there's something and even God bless those guys at the Beirut Veterans of America who early on endorsed the project. And their first duty is to remember. But as we all know, if we could just remember, we wouldn't need public schools. We wouldn't need universities. It takes techniques to remember. So I'm hoping within this film, and the main technique is, and, and it's everyone that served there, who, or everyone who is in Beirut, they're telling the story and I'm stitching them together. And we've been very fortunate and mainly through the help of Beirut Marines who happened to bump into people on deployments. And, you know, we were able to get um, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. He and his wife were in the embassy when it blew up. He's been our great superstar ambassador of the Middle East through many presidents. Um, former Secretary of the Navy, Vietnam Marine Jim Webb, who visited right before the bombing. Um, there's other people I've, I've got, um, you know, a United States congressman who visited twice in 1982, once in July, and met all the players, all the faction leaders met at the American ambassador's residence. He went back in November with John Murtha, who was the first Vietnam veteran elected to Congress from Pennsylvania, if anybody remembers him. And, you know, when you read what Murtha wrote, I mean, he knew flying in, it, it was a mess. So, um, what are Marines doing in this position? And and I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, shine the light on what the Marines were doing in that position, why they weren't allowed to, why, you know, why this peacekeeper role didn't include going out and pushing out and taking a bigger perimeter to protect yourself more. I mean, again, some of these questions will never be answered, but I'm 
absolutely talking to everybody I can. I'm listening. Anybody can get a hold of me. If you go to wecameinpeace.us, the contact form comes directly to me. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, and, and that's it. I just, I'm honored to be able to tell this story. It's not an easy story to tell. It's taken a little longer than I thought it would. But, um, but again, I think as, um, as what, what will the film do? Well, it will remember the Beirut veterans, but I think even more important, it becomes a historical document that fills in this time between Vietnam and the Gulf War somewhat as much as it can, or at least gets people interested in it. Um, and it gives the human history. So it's very easy to connect to these people that were there. If you think about, if you look at Pearl Harbor, there's always as big as Pearl Harbor was, it seems like whatever the account is, there's two stories. There's the African-American cook who jumps up on the anti-aircraft gun on the West Virginia. And there's a pilot at one of the fields who gets off and has a dog fight. And you don't hear much of the people. This film it's all the people that were there. And it goes, again, Secretary of Navy, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and a whole lot of grunts. And everybody's slice of that field is sort of different. So to put them all together, um, you know, it, it, it's a job, but, it, but I think it's going to become, I, I think it's going to help people at least dig in more with Lebanon and at least recognize it. Because for whatever reason, um, it just kind of went away. I mean, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand though how two government investigations on what happened in the bombing wrapped up in two months. Like, when is the go United States government ever wrapped up an investigation in two months? Not just one, but two. I mean, I don't understand being the civilian here on the outside of the wire looking in. I don't understand, and maybe there was, and I'm not aware because maybe it's not public knowledge. But was there a Marine Corps? investigation that put everything under the microscope. So I don't know. I think my brother's on here, medevac pilot, um, retired uh, dust-off pilot. And um, I know he would tell me, you know, Mogadishu, boy, every time you go and your aircraft gets fired up and the crew chief walks on that aircraft, things change because the army put Mogadishu under the microscope. I don't know if that happened with the Marine Corps, but I'm, I'm sure trying to find out um, I'm doing the best job I can. I'll take whatever help you have. If there's people on here that have um, pictures, letters home. Again, it's a personal story. I think that's how America will connect to it at this time. Um, but I'm 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 open. I'm a, everybody I've interviewed. Some of them are on here, you know, right now. Thank you guys, and you're all collaborators. So. I'm listening and I'm honored and I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I'm open to conversations if you guys want to contact me. Can I just jump in here, Brad, real quick? Yes. Quick, just Michael, ask your question. No, the Marine Corps never did an, uh, an in-depth investigation. And uh, when I was out at the Reagan Library earlier this year, uh, I did confirm there is a classified version of the Long Commission report. There's two boxes of material that are classified and... Um, the first person who asked for it to be declassified was in 2008, and it hasn't, he hasn't gotten a response yet. So I don't know what's in those boxes, but it sure would be interesting to know what's in the classified version of the. Well, and, and one of the one living, it's Bud, it, it's, it's Bud McFarlane, right, who, a uh, Vietnam Marine, who ends up getting into the um the National Security Administration, and then he becomes, you know, in the Reagan administration, he's moving up. He gets as the special envoy to go to Lebanon. A guy that's left, I think you pronounce his last name, Tosher, Howard Tosher. You're from Howard Tosher, yeah. Howard Tosher. Tosher. Well, so everything you try to find on Howard Tosher, if it's in the Reagan Library, the National Archives, wherever it's at, it's all classified. And he was the senior advisor to Bud McFarland. I don't you know, 40 years later, should it still be classified? We don't know. Well, you know, we don't know. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's, um, I think if we can open it up to our Beirut veterans to, to speak, if they want, you know, it's 40 years, 40 year anniversary, but our veterans live with the Beirut every single day in one way or another. So I realize how difficult it is to talk about it but I think our audience um, or heroes out there, our veterans that served in Beirut, I would like to open it up for, for discussion and comments about what they're feeling and what they felt going into Beirut and, um, and how they're handling it after all these years. Chuck? 
Chuck, can I ask you to start if you can, sir? No. No, I'd rather not. Okay. Maybe we can start with a very interesting comment, Judith. Uh, Judith Young, uh, you were former president of the Gold Star Mothers. Uh, your son was KIA and the bombing, but you had a very interesting comment here uh, based off what Mike said about uh, that it's been forgotten. You said that it hasn't been forgotten in Lebanon. That's correct. Can you tell me why? Because they they have a 20 mile march every year up into the mountains to their memorial for their wounded in the Civil War, and they do it on October the 23rd every year. And I was with the Freedom Fighters just last weekend, and believe me, they don't forget. What was their view of, of the Americans that were there? I would just like to say one thing. As far as the camps, when I questioned them about the camps, they said, it is not what you really see on the news. It's not, it, it was kind of over-exaggerated as to supposedly the killing of the women and children. Um, they assured me that's, that was not the complete story. Um, they wanted that to be known. Mel, when, when were you in, in Lebanon? Last weekend. Uh, Judith. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mel. Mel, when were you in Lebanon? Well, uh, <laughs> I have a little list of dates and things that we did, but the general pretty much covered everything. But uh, our, I was with, uh, at that time, the 32nd mile, and we sailed on May 25th of 1982, uh, five ship amphibious ready group. And we were going to the Mediterranean. In those days, you always had a five ship group in the Mediterranean, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It never was uncovered. Uh, so we would arrive in Rota, Spain and turn over with the mile that was outgoing. Uh, so that's what happened. We sailed on the 25th, our five ships. Uh, our battalion commander was Lieutenant Colonel Bob Johnston and uh, Grady Geske was my CO in uh, the squadron. Our squadron had 12, air, 12 H-46s, this was typical, four H-53s, four Cobras, and two Hueys on a small, what I would call a helicopter carrier called the Guam. We got to the road to Spain on June 6th, uh, having crossed the Atlantic. And uh, on that day, we were all, you know, they, they guys went ashore, and within two hours, they all called back to the ship because the Israelis had invaded uh, Lebanon. And their operation piece for Galilee. So everybody got back on the ships and we went max speed to the east, Eastern Mediterranean. Um, as we went by Sigonella, uh, Sicily and uh, Suda Bay Crete, we flew aircraft in there to pick up people, weapons, systems, uh, ammunition, uh, mail and, and supplies and things. And we got to uh, what's called the mod modified location, uh, mod lock is what we call it, on the 6th of June. Uh, that was a 50 mile by 50 mile box, 100 miles off the shore. And then we prepared for the embassy evacuation. And at the same time, we did what we called shuttle diplomacy. Uh, Mr. Habib and, uh, and his other negotiators, we'd fly in between Tel Aviv and Beirut uh, routinely. And also we'd pick up people up in Cyprus and bring them down and, and for, uh, to get involved in these negotiations. And the whole time we're getting ready for this uh, embassy evacuation, uh, which did occur as the general mentioned, uh, June 24th. Now it was all by sea. Uh, the small boats from the uh, other ships in our group uh, went into the port area. And we had two companies, two infantry companies go ashore Ken McCabe's Echo Company and uh, Rick Zilmer's Foxtrot Company. And they picked up all these people, put them in little boats, went off to the big ships and the big ships took them up to Cyprus. Uh, we stayed around then for quite a while doing shuttle diplomacy. Uh, again, flying Habib around and Morris Draper and these other guys trying to figure out what, what was gonna be done there. Uh, 
by the 26th of July, the ships all went back to Naples. Uh, we did keep a Huey debt, two uh, UH-1s to fly Mr. Habib around, and I was with them. We went to the Independence first, which is a carrier, and we were there for about 10 days. Then we went to the Forestall for another seven or eight days. Then we went back to the Independence for, for another week or so. The ships came back on uh, about August 20th to get ready for the PLO evacuation. Now, that occurred on the 25th of August, and I was, as one of the uh, operations officers for the, for the MAU, I was for the squadron, they sent us ashore to observe. And observing the PLO evacuation, uh, anybody was there would never forget it for the rest of their lives because we were in the port area and all these bombed out buildings standing around. And we just waited and slowly you could hear firearms going off and uh, big trucks bringing the PLO fighters. They all were dressed in brand new gr green fatigue uh, you know, utilities. Uh, They're all firing their AKs and SKs up in the air. It wasn't just guys, it was uh, women and kids and not just all uh, uh, Mediterranean type people. Uh, we saw uh, obviously Europeans in there with red hair and red, uh, uh, red beards and things. Uh, a thousand and some were processed the first day. They put them on the Saul Georgius, a ship to send them up to Cyprus and something like 6,000 over the, over the few, two or three days. Processing was basically taking their names down and put them on the ship. And they sent them up to Cyprus and then they flew them to wherever all these people went. Uh, so that was supposed to be the end of it for us. Um, ships go back to Naples on September 10th. And then, as the general mentioned, the, on the September 16th is when they had the massacres at Sabra and Shatila. And he talked all about that. And why it happened and who watched and who didn't do anything. And so as, as also was covered, the multinational force comes back or what becomes a multinational force at the end of September. Uh, we flew in one of the companies, two of the companies went in by sea. And then by the end of October, we were relieved by the 24th mile. So that's the first unit was in there, did all the things the general mentioned. That's kind of how we got there. What was your impression of Lebanon when you when you stepped foot there? Well, uh, as he mentioned, it was uh, it was pretty chaotic. Uh, but also, he mentioned that it was kind of after you know we all went in for the with the multinational force and all went ashore. Uh, it was it was kind of quiet. In fact, the day or two before we left uh, to go back uh, back home. We went up to, there were several in my unit, along with our CEO and a couple other people that went up to some restaurant up in the mountains overlooking the city. And it was pretty quiet and beautiful at that time. Obviously, that did not continue. And all the factions, uh, which we learned about, couldn't believe how many different factions there were with their, like, as you mentioned, all their own militias. And uh, they got into it later on. So, um and we went back the second time. We talked about this last week at Grenada because we were going to Lebanon, uh, getting ready to go back. And that was all our focus. And two or three days out of port, we turned south and did Grenada. And when that was over, then we headed to uh, Lebanon and got there on about the 17th of November uh, for our second time. And then pulled all the Marines out in the end of uh, f f uh, February. Um, so... It was dramatically different the second time we went. Obviously, it was after the bombing. Uh, the New Jersey was there uh, firing 16-inch rounds into the mountains. Uh, just totally different. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brad, I was going to pose to you the same question. What was You were there. What was your impression? Well... Yeah, the picture you see is is my friend Mike Haskell, and we have his brother uh, Jeff with us tonight. Uh, Mike and I were friends. We served together in Okinawa, and that's on top of the uh, BLT headquarters in September. Our unit, the 31st Marine Amphibious Unit, came up from Africa through the Suez Canal to reinforce. And, you know, Lebanon, Beirut from a distance from the sea is just beautiful. Blue, blue seas. 
mountains, white buildings. But as we mentioned earlier, as soon as the sun went down, you saw tracer rounds going from one hilltop to the next, and you heard the explosions. Uh, so it was a very, very dangerous place. And uh, first time I flew in a helicopter, like Mel, Mel flew, was we skimmed over the water, just feet above the wa uh, feet water, as low as we could get with the machine gunner manning the 50 caliber machine gun and landing in Beirut and uh, getting off even before the helicopter stopped uh, rolling. But it was a very, uh, you know, Beirut uh, International Airport is flat. And then as you looked, uh, to, as you looked uh, east, there was mountains and towns and uh, it was um, a war and torn place. And uh, the Marines I met, uh, Mike Haskell and others were just so dedicated and professional in a very difficult position took great pride in what they were doing. And, uh, you know, Mike Caskell was a, was a friend and I think about him every October. And, uh, and he was, I think, highly respected by all who met him. And uh, Jeff, I know you're out there listening and uh, I don't wanna put you on the spot. Is there anything you'd like to say about, about Mike to the audience that we can learn a little bit? There we go. Um, I just want to thank uh, everybody for putting this on specifically. Um, uh, a big shout out to uh, Chuck Daly. Uh, over the years, um, he has stepped up and, and gotten me names of people. Uh, it's 40 years later, and I just found out, I just found Brad. And Brad knew my brother and knew his sense of humor and liked him anyway. Um, uh, Mike had gone in right out of high school. He went in. Um, and was a drone instructor for a few years, got to college, back in. Uh, I've just been extremely, extremely lucky um, to be able to be in, <clears throat> excuse me, to be in uh, events such as this. Uh, there was a, a symposium up in um, Pennsylvania about a month ago about the bombing. Um, we, we meet um, uh, Every the 23rd of October uh, in Arlington, there are eight or nine uh, Marines buried there and a, a memorial tree. Uh, I get down to Jacksonville as soon as much as I can. Um, this year, I think there's going to be, um, which I think they did about 10 years ago, where they are going to be on a football field and weapons company and HS will all get together and you walk in there with them. And I just said my last name, and you know, it's like old home week. Uh, everybody is phenomenally giving. And 40 years later, uh, I, I couldn't be sadder and happier at the same time. Thank you. Yes, Eric, Eric you've been you've had your hand up for a while. Let, let's uh, have you ask your question or make a comment. Hey, guys, how are you? Uh, Eric Bemenek, I was with uh, 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines uh, in Lebanon, 82, 83 and 84. Uh, thank you guys so much for putting this together. Um, it really. Uh, it really came home to me. I was, I was a, an NYPD detective, uh, retired 2017, 9-11, uh, when I got down to the site. And I saw the, the personal effects of everybody. I just went right back to Beirut, remembering the personal effects in that crater. Um, and I remember, I remember they, they were debriefing us after, uh, about a month after 9-11, we, we were getting debriefed. And there was a uh, psychiatrist there, and I explained that to him. I said I was a Beirut Marine, and 9-11 uh, took me right back. And he uh, afterwards, he handed me his card. He said, things are going to get worse. You might need this. And I, I looked at him, you know, like, like, what are you talking about? Because we, we lived with these memories and these thoughts and, and, and these tragedies. Um, and just we were just, uh, you know, kids. Um, and guys that were having issues early on that were going to the VA, the VA wasn't even recognizing them as, as being in combat. And then, you know, one, one guy, a good friend of mine, he was screaming, I, I got a combat action ribbon. What the F do you mean? I, I wasn't in combat, you know? So, so that was, that was a struggle as well. I, I, I was, for, I stayed away from the VA. I, you know, I stayed away from all of that and I gravitated to, to my buddies to the guys that went there. And I just want to thank Michael Ivey. Uh, <laughs> I can't say enough about him. You know, um, 
y- y- your heart for this and your passion for this and everything that you're walking through doing this is just, uh, I cannot thank you enough. Um, and and uh, for Mel, uh, uh, Captain Captain Merrigan flew me into Grenada and his brother was a machine gunner in, uh, in Fox 2-8. Um, Captain and I remember- Merrigan. Yes. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt last weekend. Ah, yeah, his, his brother Matthew is no longer with us, but uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, great, 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 uh, great people. Anyway, thank you guys so much, uh, Semper Fi, and uh, our first duty is to remember. And, and, and I'm learning so much from walking through this process, um, the history, the politics involved, because we had absolutely no idea. We were 18 years old. You just wanted to. You you just wanted a beer and and, and you wanted a, a a a warm body to lay down to in the form of a female, and that's all you cared about. You know, you didn't think about all this other stuff that was going on. And and uh, I really appreciate you guys digging deep, Mike. Uh, thank you, thank you, all of you. Take care. Thank you very much, Eric. Brad, did you want to go to Chuck Daly? He put a, a comment here in the chat. Chuck, would you mind saying it? In the, in the chat, I see that someone knew Sergeant Major Douglas. I just wanted to personalize him just a little bit. Uh, tell, tell whoever put this note in there that Sergeant Major Douglas, I knew him very well. Uh, when we were back in Lejeune before we deployed, he fought pretty hard to make the deployment with us because he was at retirement age and uh, he had to, had a fight to make the deployment. And then once in Beirut, uh, he had high blood pressure and the doc wanted to send him home. And uh, they actually sent him to uh, Naples, Italy for a medical check. And the docs in Naples sent us a message and said they're sending him home. And the next thing you know, he's back in Beirut. And we asked him, how come you're not on your way home? And he jumped the helicopter and, and basically made his own way back to Beirut. So he died in the bombing. Mm. And I believe they named a barracks at uh, South Weymouth Naval Air Station after him. Chuck, I did not know the Sergeant Major, but after reading about him, he had a presence about him. And he was, I guess he was a large man, powerfully built, but he had- He's about six, seven, 280 pounds. Yeah, that's big. Yeah. <laughs> and he had the respect of all the Marines that, uh, that came to know him and his actions really speak uh, uh, speak all there is for him. So- Yep. Um, and we have Mike here who said he served under Captain Haskell and Sergeant Major Douglas. You know, if I can, uh, you know, Mike Haskell, <laughs> his sense of humor, what does that mean? Well, when I was a brand new lieutenant checking into the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, we checked in kind of late because uh, they had already been deployed to uh, to uh, uh, the Philippines. We caught up with them. I walked into a room and there was Mike Haskell along with the other lieutenants. And he was the senior salty lieutenant there. And I was the junior second lieutenant just coming aboard to the unit. And he was, you know, stuck out his hand with that toothy smile he had and said, welcome aboard, Lieutenant Washaba. And, uh, you know, I thought that, you know, it was a nice warm welcome. And, of course, uh, what I was doing was entering the entering the trap that he, nor- he set. And he said, well, where are you from, Lieutenant? I said, well, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. You mean Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? not Kansas, but Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I said, yes, I, I don't believe it. This is just a, a small world. Uh, what what part of Pittsburgh? Well, I said, you know, I'm from Penn Hills. You're kidding me. Penn Hills? I just, I mean, the chances of this is just unbelievable. We're, we're about in Penn Hills. How far from the library? Okay, well, how far from the uh, police station? I think I got it vectored in. You won't believe this, but I grew up hundreds of miles away from there. And he just named the town, you know, he, he just reeled me in hook, line and sinker thinking I found a home, homebody, a friend. And uh, he got a good laugh out of that. But <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was just Mike Haskell. And uh, I tell you, he knew his stuff. 
as an infantryman and as a leader, he taught me a lot, uh, especially about his sense of humor, uh, <laughs> even though how how strange it can be at times in, in tough situations, it can really do a lot to, to break the ice and, and bring people together. Mike, you said you served under Mike Haskell and Sergeant Major Douglas? Yes, I did. Mike Stringent, uh, 1st Battalion, 8th Marine C Company. I was in 3rd Platoon. Uh, it's the 24th mile. Uh, my, my boots hit the ground in Beirut. I was 19 years old. Uh, my first deployment to the Mediterranean was under Cap Has Captain Haskell. He was our uh, a company commander. And uh, we talked about his humor, his witty humor. Um, we were on the USS Nassau at the time. And uh, we cut the, uh, the plastic off the mattresses. The ship was brand new. So, uh, you know, we were the first unit to deploy on it. And uh, one of the missions that we had is we, uh, we remained at sea at 45 days, um, replenishing at sea and things of that nature. And this is before we deployed to Beirut. This was my deployment before that. Uh, the story goes, it ties in Captain Haskell. So after the 45 days, we were going into port. I believe it was Italy. I could be wrong with the location, but I believe it was Italy. I'll never forget. He holds a com uh, company formation up on deck, and Captain Haskell gets out. He goes, listen, Marines, you all been at ship, you all been at sea for about 45 days. You get off this ship with a hard dick and a fist full of dollars. You're liable to get back on this ship with a lot more than you bargained for. So just be careful out there. It just spoke to his humor and his wit. Um, but I too, uh, just like Eric said, I just want to thank everybody for putting this on and, uh, you know, specifically Mike Ivey, uh, I did have the fortune of speaking to him directly and, and I learned a lot and I was, I was very encouraged by the amount of knowledge that he gained, but I was very disappointed in myself and what little knowledge that I gathered over the years. Um, and since that first conversation, I've become, um, basically a student of this and, and I've, been spending a lot of time trying to figure out, learn as much as I possibly can. I too um, joined the uh, symposium um, earlier this month and uh, put on by the, Carmi, the Carlisle Army War College and Dickinson University, which was magnificently done. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, the uh, the speakers was um, a young lady uh, who uh, was three years old when we were in Beirut, um, and uh, she is now a professor at Dickinson University. Um, you know, and when they opened it up for questions and answers, uh, the first young lady who was um, obviously by her uh, wardrobe, you could tell that uh, she was Muslim. Um, and uh, her question was simple uh, and, and it was poignant and it made the entire symposium in my estimation a complete success. Again, a young lady rose her hand and she said, where can I get more information on this? So that solidifies our duty to remember, um, you know, and one of the gentlemen that were interviewed on the, uh, the short piece we saw, you know, uh, it, most folks don't remember because they didn't know. But um, anyway, um, enough of me. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here. Um, uh, it was very well done. Very informative. Sorry, I had to jump on late. I'm in my car. I'm coming back from a business meeting, but uh, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Brad, I've got something about Sergeant Major Douglas. Okay, go ahead, Mel. Well, Doug Dorr had already sent you a little uh, email, I think, but, but the bottom line is uh, we were heading down to Grenada and we made the, uh, our launch was on October 25th. Well, of course, the bombing occurred on 23rd, on 23rd and it was a big downer for us. But anyway, after we successfully captured the airfield down there. The, uh, I don't know if it was Echo or Fox Company, renamed the uh, airfield that we had assaulted, uh, which was called Pearls Airfield. They called it MCAS Douglas after Sergeant Major Douglas. If you haven't seen this picture, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see yeah. this? Oh yeah, we can yeah. see it now. Okay, there's a 53 there, and then you can see MCAS Douglas in the background. Yes. You see that? Yes. And so I think anyway, this is a watercolor done by Mike Leahy, who was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, reservist retired who worked for the Naval Air Systems Command as a uh, public affairs guy. And he did all these watercolors down in Grenada. Uh, that, so uh, that, sign, that sign that actually hung there is now in the Marine Corps uh, Museum. It's 
it's it's a display up there. So it has been retrieved and is on display for everybody to see and yeah. remember Sergeant Major Douglas. Greg Yost, you had a question here in the chat. Interesting. Yes. Thank you all. First of all, thank you all for your service and very much. Thank you for telling these stories. I think we need to hear these. I appreciate listening to all this. I think it's tremendously valuable. For the Marines who were there in Beirut, did you ever actually leave the base, the airport? Did you go out on any missions or for the whole time you were there? And I guess maybe there would be a before and after the bombing thing. Before the bombing, had you actually even ever left the airport or were you sort of just sitting around waiting for something to do? And I hate to say sort of making yourself a target, but that, and you weren't the ones doing that. But it, did you ever leave the base and do any do any missions? <clears throat> I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one because I think I was in the beginning, uh, my platoon was probably one of the more fortunate ones. We were the recon platoon. They had, the Lebanese government wanted the, you know, the Marines patrol East Beirut that literally came down all the way from the Joint Staff all the way down through the chain of command and, and uh, Blackjack Matthews tapped our platoon and we were out. Uh, we started patrolling on 4 November of uh uh, 82 and did two patrols a day every day until the day we left, except for the week we got off for Christmas when they sent us to Turkey. So I, I got, I was one of the fortunate ones that went out and did presence patrols in East Beirut every day. And I, we counted ourselves lucky that we weren't out on the line, um, you know, stuck at the airport, quite frankly. Over. Listen, uh, Jeff Hammond, you're out there. Can you tell us your connection to Beirut and what you're doing today? Just unmute. Yeah. Oh, here. Here, here we go. He's got it. We've got to ask him to unmute. There we go. Yeah, sir. Oh, here. Hi, I, uh, years ago, I uh, <clears throat> had an interest in. Uh, I had seen the Beirut Memorial and I uh, didn't know of its existence prior to that. And I thought if, you know, I was kind of plugged in to some degree and I thought, well, if I didn't know, then, you know, maybe there's a way and the web was kind of coming around the internet and all that. So I got involved in a project. Judy Young, who was just here, was the first person I met and then helped me out a lot with it, uh, with the Beirut Memorial online. So the idea back then was do a little bit of the history, but mostly collect a face to a name, you know, so the families have been really gracious about both supplying pictures and giving me a little history. I mean, given stuff from when they played baseball as a youth and, and all that going fishing and, you know, cause I was interested in the total person, you know, so yeah. got a, a lot of, a lot of photos like that. And then also hometowns and ranks, they helped, uh, you know, hone that part of the site to get accurate hometowns. So it's really been, kind of a labor of love. Um, I also wanted to mention a few things about Sergeant Major Douglas. Uh, I talked to a Marine named, uh, oh, oh, I guess over the years, I, I talk a lot, just like uh, Mike, uh, Mike does, you know, with the veterans and I've just became, you know, just really engrossed with all the stories and it was just, it was just fascinating. So um, I feel like that person is sharing a deep, the deepest part of them. So I, you know, give it that respect. But uh, I talked to a Marine named Rusty Jarvis, and he happened to be at the Sixth Fleet Medical with Sergeant Major Douglas at the time. And I forget if it was like just he was doing medical himself or he was uh, in between orders or he was catching a sh uh, ride back to the ship or whatever, but he was disillusioned over the medical treatment he was getting. So was Sergeant Major. And Sergeant Major just popped in and says, pack your bag. Let's get it. So they they found a a, a a hop flight or whatever and got back to Beirut and he shared with me some of the conversations he had on the plane, you know, which was kind of meaning, meaningful. Um, but as far as Mike Ivey, I, I've uh, just because I run the uh, Beirut Memorial online, I'm nobody really special, but I tend to get a lot of contacts from uh, people that are doing documentaries, uh, History Channel, Discovery Channel. CNN presents Fox war stories, you know, a lot of those over the years. And, um, and I help out a lot with it, but what always happens seems to happen from my perspective is they, 
they have these grandiose plans to, to cap. I want to capture it and I want to do it right and all these things. And then when I start talking to them about, uh, you know, just some of the um, dynamics with all the, uh, the tribes or the factions over there, it's kind of like a kaleidoscope of trust that breaks and forms again, you know, with, with uh, all those factions. But you have to understand all that to understand the context of where the Marines were inserted there. So, uh, so after a while, they just kind of, you could just see their eyes gloss over and they just want to pull out and do something quick and dirty. <laughs> you know, and I don't think they want to do the in-depth, but Mike was different. And he, he wanted to stay with it. And, and I was, I was a little skeptical at first, not anything directly related to him, but just, you know, just my experience over the years, but, but he wanted to stay with it. And he, and he, uh, you know, got to know all these Marines and, and, you know, and, and sailors and, and army. And, and, you know, I think he's uh, done a really good job with what he's doing and it's, and it's really a, a nice capture. And, and I'm sure it's meaningful for all these guys to tell their story to somebody that really wants to listen. So my hat's off to him. Yeah. And that you're, you're so right, Jeff, that history or that context of the mission is so complex and I've heard three or four times tonight, Marines, you know, chide themselves for not uh, understanding when they were 18 or 19 years old, the this, you know, geopolitical situation in Beirut in 1983. And I got to tell you, 40 years later, professional historians and political scientists still have a tough time unraveling just what was going on there. Je uh, George Brown, how are you, George? Hey, I'm doing good this evening. <clears throat> uh, as always, uh, Todd, uh, fantastic presentation, and uh, gosh, it's uh, it, it's really something because when I saw this uh, uh, Zoom um, subject, uh, it was really close to home. Uh, Major John uh, McCroglu, uh, we went to high school together. He was uh, he was two years behind uh, two years behind me and uh, a good friend of my brother-in-law. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> after, you know, after high school, you kind of drift away, but uh, uh, everybody always kept in touch with uh, the guys that were in the military and what they were doing and where they were going and whatever. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, several people have said, you know, really didn't know what was going on in Lebanon. And, uh, but uh, uh, based on uh, the little, little chat, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, I belong to an organization, uh, the Southwest chapter of the Vietnam Veterans of America. And every year uh, we do a Tet Remembrance. And uh, about three years ago, we started to include those folks from um, our area that were uh, essentially uh, uh, casualties of the war on terror. And uh, John was uh, John was one of the first ones to be in that category. So um, solid citizen, and uh, you know. Uh, remember as best I can, you know, the, the fact that uh, even though he was uh, two years behind me in school, you uh, were as plain as day. That's it. Thank you, George. And, and you know, you raise an interesting question. I, I've been at the, uh, at the TET dinner when John and others have been remembered. And, uh, and it's interesting that for, here we are 40 years later, and we could see this bombing, this event, in that larger, longer context of the global war on terror, it was kind of the beginning of something, although we didn't know it at the time. Has that, this is a hard question to ask, you know, Mel and Brad and uh, I can have Mike and, and Chuck chime in. Um, has Have the subsequent wars in the Middle East, the subsequent, you know, terrorist acts uh, at home and abroad, has it, have you kind of understood your service in Lebanon differently now 
that you looking back 40 years, you know, of of kind of uh of turmoil in the Middle East. <laughs> Tough question, Todd. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I don't know, you know, for the guys that uh that went, I'm gonna go real basic here, is which is that you know, we uh we were there at the beginning, my group, and we were there at the end. We uh we had some losses uh more at the end than in the beginning, uh, but we all thought we did the best we could. And so we're proud of, I think we're proud of each other and the work we did. As far as all the other things that have gone on in the Middle East, I mean, I just, there's just no end in sight to it. Those, uh, you know, you got, you, got, you got what you got going on now in Israel and you had the 48 war in Israel, the 56 war, the 73 war, yeah. uh, you know, the, the peace for Galilee in 82. Then there's other ones after that. And it just, it just, I don't see an end to it at all. Is, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I just don't. I don't know if that answers it, but I, maybe did it give you a sense of kinship with those mar young Marines who served in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, oh yeah, sure. I mean, we followed. I did. We followed everything that that happened. Um, you know, you you, you want to. Uh, help them along if you've got anything good to offer them. But in in my particular case, that which we had was, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand, when you went off on your own on a on ships and things pop up in your face and you're the only ones there to do it, that's different than when, you know, your unit comes in and they're the fourth unit into that area having to deal with all the stuff that they did. So um, I, I don't. I'm not being very helpful here at all, but, uh, uh, you know, we tried to give back as much as we could and we, we still do, you know, it's just that things, things have changed dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have ships like we used to have anymore. i I don't like that at all. We, a good friend of mine who was in a squadron with me in the seventies out in Westpac, um, I, I share with them every week, the Naval Institute, uh, where are all the Marines and uh, Navy ships? There's, they have a column every week with pictures and where all the ships are. And a few months ago, he he asked me, he said, hey, uh, there's no amphibious group, no Marine uh, expeditionary unit in the Med. Uh, you know, why is that? And and I said, well, I don't know. And I went back probably six months worth of, of those columns, and there hadn't been one in, in a long time. And that's because there aren't enough ships and uh, m many fewer than we used to have. That that really bothers me. Um, and because we don't have the ships and we don't have guys that know anything about ships, we don't have the uh, savvy, so to speak, uh, that you get when you're routinely working off ships uh, as a Marine. And, uh, you know, it's the more you know about that, the better off you're going to be if that ever happens uh, this, to, to be in your face. Thank you, Mel. I'm looking at the clock. I know we have two minutes left, and I want Brad to give a, uh, a kind of a preview of, of next week. But, Mike, you have your hand up. You, you know, I just wanted to make a quick point. You asked a direct question about um, a kinship. I've recently joined a, a vet group at our local vet center for a number of reasons, and but most of which I'm, I'm trying to give back a little bit. And um, I'm spending some time with the group. Overwhelming majority of the folks in this group are post 911 vets, right. uh, small contingent of Vietnam vets. And there is one single Beirut vet. They call me Beirut Mike. OK, <laughs> and um, I missed a week or two because of business travel and things of that nature. And the, uh, the facilitator of the group, um, Army Ranger in Granada, um, just, just a true warrior, um, you know, he grabbed me after the, the, the next meeting and he said, Mike, he said, you know, these guys need you here. Yeah. He said, you're like the liaison between yes. Vietnam and, and, and Afghanistan. He said, we need you here. He said, that, you know, try to make yourself available. And, and I feel it and I'm enjoying it. And it's, it's both, uh, you know, um, 
helpful to me and it's and, and I know it's helpful to them. Um, you know, but the other part of the question that you asked, um, you know, about, um, you know, our role, I, I understand and I am growing to understand even more what our role was there. Um, but it's still insulting that it's still glazed over and not talked about. And in the symposium in Carlisle, they drew the parallel lines between the 83 attack and the 9-11 attack. And they did a fabulous job of it. And, you know, if, maybe if we would have done this here, maybe we would have had a chance to stop that. You, but, you know, maybe. It, it's a big maybe. But, you know, as, uh, as the officer said, uh, they've been fighting for a long time. You could take it back to the biblical days and they're going to be fighting for a long time before in front of us. We can only do, you know, one piece at a time. But anyway. And I think it's helpful to think of the past 40 years as one thing, as one conflict that is extremely complicated and then has spanned generations of uh, soldiers and sailors and Marines. Brad, we're doing yes. this next week. We're getting together again next week to yes, continue our conversation about yes. this. And, you know, I want to thank all our guests, all our veterans, everybody that came aboard tonight to, to hear the story, to listen to veterans. It's a story that can't be forgotten. We can't forget those that uh, went in peace to provide freedom for others, their sacrifice and bravery, we can't forget. There are so many names and stories that need to be mentioned. I saw an item in the chat about Lieutenant Colonel Larry Gerlaw. He was invited to, to appear tonight, but his health is in is you know is not the best, but he's been in a wheelchair for the last 40 years. Uh, he was blown out of the building and luckily survived and has lived with this like the other veterans have every single day of his life. And we just can't forget their sacrifice, their service. And we can't forget the lessons. We, you know, we need to ask ourselves, we need to ask the veterans, was it worth it? What did they take from it? And where does that put us in history? And there's so much more to the story. Next week, we'll have uh, Rabbi Reznikov with us, a, uh, a chaplain that was there on the scene in the aftermath of the bombing. His report is, uh, will be read by President Reagan at, at a convention. We'll get to hear that, uh, interact with him and other Beirut veterans uh, next week. So I hope that everybody can come back again next week for more stories, more reflections, more, more chances to thank and to express gratitude and to remember. See you a week from tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, everybody. Good night.